right, good afternoon, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Scharf. I'm the co-dean of the law school, and it is my great, great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Norman A. Sugarman Lecture. This lecture was made possible by the generosity of Mr. Sugarman's law firm, Baker Hostetler, and numerous clients and friends. And Baker Hostetler has a special place in this law school, including the fact that we are in the Baker Hostetler courtroom. And your dean is the Baker Hostetler Professor of Law. So we're very, very happy to have this special relationship. Mr. Sugarman, one of our most distinguished alumni, was a native Clevelander and a double alumnus of the university. He was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Adelbert College, and he graduated at the head of his class here at the law school. He was recognized with the Fletcher Reed Andrews Outstanding Alumnus Award and his election to the Society of Ventures. He held a variety of positions at the Internal Revenue Service from 1940 to 1954, including ultimately assistant commissioner. He was the first non-political appointee to that job. Mr. Sugarman returned to Cleveland in 1954 and spent the rest of his career as a, as a partner at Baker Hostetler. He was extremely talented, thoughtful, and creative as a tax lawyer with an almost encyclopedic knowledge of the Internal Revenue Code. A frequent lecturer all over the country, he had an uncanny ability to present complex topics in understandable terms. And that's why it is so fitting that this lecture be named after him, and we are in for a really exciting lecture. To introduce this year's Sugarman lecturer, I present Paul Feinberg, who was a partner at Mr. Sugarman and of Mr. Sugarman and is a long-term member of our wonderful adjunct faculty. Paul? Uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Rob Wexler. Uh, the program uh, details his uh, many academic and professional accomplishments, including uh, articles he has written about today's topic. I worked with, I've worked with uh, Rob over a number of years as a member of the ABA Tax Section's uh, Exempt Organizations Committee. Uh, he recently completed a two-year term as chair of this committee, and during that time he effectively oversaw some key committee efforts to obtain clarification of a number of issues vexing those of us working in the field of tax-exempt organizations. His firm, Adler & Colvin, is a small firm 19 lawyers, but with a large reputation. The firm's practice focuses almost exclusively on representing nonprofits and donors. It is highly respected with a national reputation, not only for Rob's work in the area of social enterprise and program-related investment, but also for its work in areas such as international charitable giving, uh, political activities of uh, tax-exempt organizations. By the way, the firm's website is a treasure trove of useful and free items on a wide variety of, of uh, nonprofit topics. Rob did not ask me to say that, but I've used it, and it's very good. And he's the second from his firm to uh, deliver this lecture. His partner, Greg, Greg Colvin, made a presentation in 2010 about uh, Citizens United. So I'm now pleased to present Rob Wexler, who will illuminate us about the emerging area of social invest enterprise investing. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Well, Paul, thank you for plugging the free services we have at our firm. And uh, <laughs> I always appreciate that. And um, I, I did not realize that one of the requirements for today was to try to take a complicated topic and make it understandable. I, I would have completely changed my lecture if I'd Hello known everybody. that. But, um, and also, I have to say, uh, I, this is my first time in Cleveland, so I'm, in, I'm enjoying seeing it. And, you know, but I find it a little cold, so I, I my Golden State Warriors. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I was expecting more booze than that, but I appreciate the politeness. This is my first time in Cleveland, so I'm enjoying So, what I'm going to do today is run, I have... 13 slides, but they're largely placeholders. I also, I don't know how many of you have found the paper that I put on the website. If you want to access that later, it's 
got a lot of what I'm talking about here today. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to move the slides. Hey, I did it. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, basically three parts, a uh, brief history of social impact investing, and I do mean brief. Uh, I'm going to talk about the legal framework a bit, because this is law school. And, um, and then I have some questions in case you don't have any questions, because I you never want to come prepared without questions. So part one, um, we're going to look at the history a little bit. And some of this is in my paper. And there, there's really, there's, there's better papers on the history. There's, there's some good material on some websites that I'll talk about in a little bit about the history of social impact investing. But I also want to say that because I'm in a law school, I realize that, you know, I, I write a lot of papers. I write a lot of practical tax papers that basically are about um, there's a new law or there's a new statute, a uh, new, new case. What does it mean and what are the issues? But I know academics have to come up with theories when they write law review articles and they have to be more meaningful and more thoughtful. So last night as I couldn't sleep, I came up with my theory that social impact investing parallels entirely the development of the three-point shot in basketball. And uh, I'm going to follow that up as we go along. But basically, um, I really believe there's a parallel and it's completely meaningless, by the way. So let's talk about um, let's talk about some of the history. The movement, uh, if it is a movement, started uh, early on in American history. And don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with tales of Puritans and pilgrims. But um, the Quakers are actually given given credit, um, at least on Wikipedia, and I think in some other places, for. Um, for having started uh, some of the, the ideas of social, social um, uh, SRI, which basically means socially responsible investing. And so this is the first iteration of impact investing. Socially responsible investing, or SRI, means imposing negative screens on investments. So what that means is basically don't invest in things that do harm to society. Now, of course, what is harmful is a subjective concept, but there seem to be some generally recognizable um, uh, agreement on, on what's harmful, and so the Quakers uh, didn't want to invest in slavery, which I think we all I think we all agree is is is, is not a good thing. Um, the um, in fact, at the 1758 Quaker meeting in Philadelphia, it was agreed that there would be no more investment in the slave trade. So fast forwarding. Um, we, we find all kinds of references throughout the next couple hundred years in um, uh, here and there in not investing in tobacco, not investing in firearms. Um, and, then we, and then we fast forward all the way to, let's say, um, the 1960s and 70s, which for many of us in the room is not really history, it's our lives. But um, we see that in the 60s and 70s, there was a tremendous effort in SRI investing, as most, many of you remember, to, uh, to vote against, to, to use our wallets to vote against apartheid in South Africa. And in fact, the uh, board member of General Motors, um, Reverend Leon Sullivan, uh, published a code of conduct on this. Uh, eventually, large institutions, colleges, and universities, as you know, may remember, stopped investing in South Africa. And um, even 75% uh, of the South African employers drafted a charter calling for the end of apartheid. It's hard to quantify what role this had exactly in ending apartheid, but I believe it had a significant role, the lack of, of outside investment. So to me, that's the, that's the important beginning in modern history of the SRI movement of, of socially responsible investing. Um, now. SRI was only so interesting because basically there were a lot of funds developing um, in the 80s and 90s. I think there were $640 billion um, in SRI, in 60 different SRI funds by the 1990s. So, you know, in modern terms, that's not a lot of money, but, but it was, it was a, decent, a decent chunk. In 1989, we had a, um, a conference on, um, the first conference on SRI investing, um, called the, um, creatively, the SRI conference. Um, and it still meets. It still, it still meets. Um, and um, 
we, we've seen uh, a, a greater evolution in, in SR investing, but that wasn't enough. So what happens now in the 2000s is we have a new concept called impact investing with its many synonyms. Um, now, some argue these aren't synonyms. Some argue that each one of these things is actually very different. But impact investing basically turns the, turns SRI on its head and says, let's not just invest in things that do harm, that don't, let's just not withhold our money from things that do harm, let's actively look for investments in things that do good, or at least that we deem that do good. So let's look for funds that are, or, or actual individual investments that are helping, that are helping the environment, helping uh, promote small and medium businesses, helping um, alleviate poverty. So, there's a definition um, from the um, uh, thegin.org, which is, and this is in my in my paper, t h e g i i n dot org, that defines impact investing as investments that are made with the intention to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact, alongside a financial return. Impact investments can be made in both emerging and developing markets, a tar and target a range of returns below market to market depending on investor strategic goals. So impact investing can be a good investment, or it can be a not quite good investment, but it basically, uh, not quite as good as other investments, but the idea is that you're doing, you're doing good while you're making money. Um, the other phrases I've heard are mission-related investing, mission-aligned investing, and then we have ESG, which is sort of the next evolution, environmental, social governance. You have a better, yeah, you have a bigger screen up here. So ESG is uh, essentially um, takes this movement to the next step and where it currently is now, which is we're looking for impact, but we're also specifically looking at impact of every investment that we make on the environment. What is the social impact? So that parallels the impact investing part. And how is the entity into which we are investing governed? Because the theory is that if the entity is governed properly, then or well, then, um, then the investment's going to be more productive. Okay, so there's a lot of jargon in this field, by the way, just like in social enterprise. Sometimes when I lecture, I come up with a bingo card of things for people to look at, look for in the audience, all these terms like robust, aligned, um, breaking down silos, triple bottom line. It's inherent in the DNA of the organization. There's all kinds of terms that people use. So, um, okay, I'll get to that in a minute. So right now, it's estimated that we have uh, almost $4 trillion invested in the impact investing space in this country. Um, now, I've got in my paper, and I don't think I'm going to spend a lot of time on this now because I don't have the websites up here. There's a lot of different aspects of impact investing. There's a whole industry out there. We have folks who are um, publishing articles about this nonstop. If you look at the Stanford Social Innovation Review, the Harvard Business Review, you can constantly find really good articles about impact investing. We have associations and, con uh, and conferences. We have uh, the annual SRI conference I mentioned. We have um, accelerators. Somebody was asking me at lunch about accelerators. There's something called Clean Tech Open. Um, there's the Full Circle Fund. There's, um, there's for-profit organizations that are set up, and their entire job is to match money with, uh, with businesses. So we have things like aligned intermediary, which handles environmental, aligned impact. Everything's got the word aligned in it. That's kind of part of the deal. Um, then we have a series of for-profit and impact funds. Virtually every major brokerage firm now has some division or some funds that they call impact funds. You can find um, uh, uh, Tonic, which uh, you can find... Uh, at Goldman Sachs has one, Sonnen Capital, all these firms, Morgan Stanley, they all have something. And then there's firms like uh, Legacy Venture, which has actually, uh, it's a small firm in Palo Alto, which runs funds, and all of the money in the funds goes into impact investments, and all the profits the investors promise to put back into charity, which is very unique. We have nonprofit funds like um, RSF Social Finance, Full Circle, and then we have organizations that are actually doing directly impact investing, impact investing, including a lot of my clients like the Skoll Foundation, uh, Silicon Valley Investors, and Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. 
So, if you look in the uh, paper, there's websites for all of these things I just mentioned, if you want to look them up. Okay, so now let's, um, let's turn to the law. Complex investments require lawyers. Um, and I, I, my job, my, my focus, as Paul said, is to represent nonprofit organizations. That's what I do. So I help nonprofits deal with sorting out between mission-related or impact investments, program-related investments, or investments that don't qualify for any of those. I help them with their documentation. I help them uh, for program-related investments, which we'll talk about in a little while. I help them sort out the legal requirements for that. But there's other groups out there that are doing impact investing. It's not all the nonprofit sector. We have, I've divided this into four groups, and I'm only going to talk about the first three briefly. But there are individuals and closely held businesses that really can do whatever they want. Um, we don't tell individuals, obviously, who to invest in or how they can invest. Um, we have uh, some examples of that. We have, well, I'll come back to that. Uh, let me just go through the categories. We have for-profit corporations with outside investors, and we do care who they invest in, not because um, we're regulated by nonprofit rules, but because of their fiduciary duties to their shareholders. Then we have the evolution of hybrid legal entities, which I'm going to address briefly, benefit corporations, social purpose corporations, which are allowed to take some liberties with their purpose. And finally, nonprofit corporations, which is really the only thing in here I know anything about. So, on the individual side, um, here's three examples. All my things are West Coast biased in my examples because those are the people I work with, those are the people I know. So um, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife set up, as you probably read, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. They're individuals. This is a limited liability company. It, inv it, does, some ch it does some charity. It does quite a bit of impact investing. They're individuals. They wholly own it. They can do whatever they want. So. That's an example of, of a lot of money that's been set aside for both impact investing and charity. The Emerson Collective is another example. Lorraine Powell Jobs, Steve Jobs' wife, um, set that up on his, uh, I guess before his death, but it's, uh, it's basically another example of a wholly owned LLC that does quite a bit of impact investing, um, but again, it's individually owned. And then the Omidyar Network, um, Pierre Omidyar, one of the eBay founders, again, these are West Coast examples. Also, uh, and, and all these folks have foundations, they have donor advised funds, they, but, but they, they also have LLCs with unrestricted money that they invest in impact investments. But there's not much to talk about legally, because like I said, they can do whatever they want. Then we have corporations with actual outside investors. Now, this, um, this part may be, um, I might get a little bit of pushback from this, I hope, later when, when we take some questions, because not all corporate lawyers agree with this, but um, I think there's a view, at least in the nonprofit side and in those of us that work with um, social enterprise, that these two key cases, Dodge versus Ford Motor Company, it's always good when you're citing a case from over 100 years ago. You know you've got a real leg to stand on. These, um, this case, and then a more recent case, um, uh, eBay Holdings versus Newmark, both uh, stand for the principle that a board of a for-profit corporation cannot just do whatever it wants. Its principal obligation is to its shareholders to make money for them. Um, and we'll talk about why this is relevant to impact investing in a minute. But the Dodge and Ford Motor case, how many of you have heard of that? Yeah, okay, some of you. That, that case essentially... Um, was in 1903. Ford Motor Company was formed in 1903. Um, the Dodge brothers uh, invested quite a bit of money in that. Um, by 1916, Henry Ford owned 58% of the company. The Dodge brothers owned roughly 10%. They were minority shareholders. Um, and all of a sudden, um, Henry Ford decided it was time to stop paying dividends or start paying small dividends and start investing in... Um, what then I think could have been called a social mission. He basically said, my ambition is to employ still more men to spread the benefits of the industrial system to the greatest possible number, to help them build up their lives and home. And to do this, we are putting the greatest share of our profits back into the business. The Dodge brothers said, no, you can't do that. We're, we're investors. We want our money. And 
The court said, basically, that Ford Motor Company had to pay an annual dividend um, of $19 million for, for one fiscal year, that Ford was not correct, that they could not uh, take the social mission uh, or the social goal of his into account over the rights of the shareholders. So this is a Michigan case, um, uh, 1903. Um, the court said specifically, the business of the corporation is organized and carry on primarily for the profit of the stockholders, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, didn't like it. 100 years later, Delaware, we have the Newmark case, eBay versus Newmark. So in this case, um, basically eBay became a minority shareholder in Craigslist um, and, uh, you know, the online classified um, service. Um, and um, when, it, when it acquired a minority stake, eBay uh, planned to acquire all of Craigslist. It wanted to do a takeover. Uh, Craig Newmark and Jim Buckmaster, the founders of Craigslist, um, put in uh, defense measures so that that couldn't happen. Um, and they sought to invalidate some, some rights, and essentially there was a fight over this. And the court said um, that, that they could not do things to jeopardize the rights and value and, and benefits to the minority shareholders. They said, uh, court said, I cannot accept as valid a corporate policy that specifically, clearly, and admittedly seeks not to maximize the economic value of a for-profit Delaware corporation for the benefit of its shareholders. Now, a lot of us took this to mean that um, if you wanted to really take into account a social purpose or social mission and social impact, that you had to have a different type of corporation that a regular for-profit corporation wasn't okay. Now, a lot of professors and scholars say that that's an overreading of this case. But let me, let's just assume I'm right for now. Um, basically, we then get to the evolution of these alternative or hybrid forms. So this is category three. Um, but before I get to that, I, I will say part of the argument stems from that there's companies doing things all the time, right, that are not for the profits. They, they make charitable contributions, right? Companies make charitable contributions. Um, one, of my one of my clients, um, I work with the charity side of this uh, company called Salesforce out in California, and they started this 1%, 1%, 1% model where they, incur they, they implemented and they encourage other corporations to devote 1% of their profits, 1% of their employee time, and 1% uh, of their product to charity. Well. Some would argue, well, why isn't that a violation of Dodge and of Newmark? And others would say, well, because it's 1%, and the whole point of that is to build goodwill for the company, which is a business purpose. Anyway, we could debate that forever, and I'm sure I would lose because I don't know as much as some of the corporate folks in the room. So let me talk about hybrids. Starting in about 2008, we see the evolution of all these new hybrid forms. The L3C is, uh, is one that neither Paul or I care for, I'm sure, right? But nonetheless, it was in 2008. We have different, so that's an LLC that was specifically allowed to make investments, for, uh, to, to run its business for things that were not for business purposes. We have benefit corporations, benefit LLCs, social purpose corporations, and the two most prevalent forms now are the Delaware Public Benefit Corporation, which is not a charity, it's a for-profit, and the Delaware Public Benefit LLC. I'll just read you what the corporation's code in Delaware says about um, the benefit cor public benefit corporation. Is a for-profit corporation organized and subject to the requirements of this chapter um, and is intended to produce a public benefit or public benefits and operate in a responsible and similar manner. To that end, a public benefit corporation shall be managed in a manner that balances the stockholders' pecuniary interests, the best interests of those materially affected by the corporation's conduct, and the public benefit or benefits identified in the certificate of incorporation. So in a public benefit corporation or LLC, you can put in a social purpose, you can put in a charitable purpose, you can put in both, you can put in environmental, you can put in ESG, and the board is free to take action, spend money, make investments, as between the business purpose and the charitable or social purpose without any repercussions uh, that, that were talked about in the Dodge and the Newmark cases. So whether or not these are legally necessary, they provide a format for people to, 
to engage in, in socially uh, purposeful activity and also potentially um, to invest their funds in social impact. Now, are these vehicles more likely to attract investment from social impact investors? I don't know that we've seen that yet. It's only been about 10 years. It's an evolving area. Um, that's why I asked the question, are hybrids any better vehicles for impact investing? I don't know the answer to that. And I can tell you that in a lot of deals we do in California where we have nonprofits spinning out for-profit subsidiaries to do activity that is um, not quite on the nonprofit side, but still consistent with their mission, um, most of the investors in those say, no, we don't want one of those public benefit things. We don't want that benefit thing. We just want a regular corporation. So we're still fighting this a lot. Um, now we come to the nonprofit area. And how many of you have worked with nonprofit corporations? Good. A lot of you. That's good. So um, as you know, um, nonprofit corporations don't have owners. All of their money is dedicated to um, to some other nonprofit purpose. There's 29 different categories of nonprofit corporation, but I'm going to talk about 501c3 um, and what that means. And Section 501c3 has, I believe, 135 words in it, and it just basically describes corporations um, and, and other charitable entities that are um, that are designed for religious, charitable, scientific, testing for public safety, literary or educational purposes, to foster international sports competition. I'm not, well, there's a his, there's story about how that got in there, but we won't go there. Prevention of cruelty to children or animals. They do put children before animals, which is nice. Um, no part of the net earnings of which inure to the benefit of any private shareholder or individual. No substantial part of the activities or the carrying on of prop propaganda, in other words, lobbying and no engaging in um, campaigns for the benefit of or opposition to political candidates. So there's five requirements. The organization has to be organized exclusively for exempt purposes, operated exclusively for exempt purposes, and the IRS says exclusively there means primarily. Um, refrain from inurement, no electioneering, and not too much lobbying. Now that's as far as I'm going to go on that, but basically 501c3s are pretty restricted. So now we're going to talk in a bit about, well, how, how did we get from there to them engaging in impact investing? Well, before we get there, the world of 501c3 is further divided between private foundations and public charities. So private foundations are essentially organizations that are founded by a single company, a, a family, a, a few limited investors, uh, donors, and they don't meet a public support test. Public charities, or not private foundations, I guess as they're technically called, are one of nine different types, hospitals, churches, schools, but mostly organizations that are publicly supported, that, that get a lot of money from a lot of different donors. It's better to be a public charity for tax purposes than a private foundation. Um, private foundations are subject to more rules, but, but a lot, other than community foundations, which have quite a bit of money, private foundations tend to hold the bulk of the, um, I don't know if this is true anymore, but private foundations traditionally have held the largest uh, amount of assets. Um, what we have now, and I'm not talking about hospitals and, and universities, which obviously are, are an exception. Universities have tremendous endowments. Um, community foundations have a lot of money in donor advised funds. We have commercial donor advised funds. But both, both donor advised funds and private foundations have to be careful um, in, in their spending. And particularly private foundations are subject to a special tax law provision that, that limits their ability to invest in investments that jeopardize their exempt purpose. So let's back up for a minute. When we're talking about investing, all 501c3 organizations have state law rules that govern their investments and federal tax rules. We have to look at both of those. On the, um, on the um, uh, state law side, most charities are either corporations or trusts, most nonprofit uh, charities under 501c3. They are typically subject to whatever corporate code in their, in their state um, 
regulates them, or if they're trusts, whatever code regulates trusts. In California, it's the probate code. Um, they're also subject to, in most states, some version of UPMIFA, the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, which used to be UMIFA, but now it's UPMIFA, as of about, what, 10 years ago, I think? Uh, maybe 20. Um, I'm told that uh, whenever, in my firm, whenever I say something happened a few, like two years ago, I always, the associates always double that. So if I say 10 years, it's 20, because I guess that's what happens. <laughs> and I don't know if that means it's 30 for you, Paul, or, yeah. <laughs> um, now, um, the California Corporations Code, for example, is an outlier. Most of the corporations codes have fairly standard investment standards in them, and you really look to up MIFA for more detail. California used to have a provision saying that corporate, nonprofit corporations must avoid speculation, looking instead to the permanent disposition of funds. Now, what the heck does that mean, avoid speculation? Does that mean you can't invest in the stock market? So we, we've been up in arms about this for since 1980 when this law came in, and um, uh, finally, in 2016, the code was changed to say, look, if you, if you satisfy a MIFA, you don't have to worry about this avoiding speculation thing. So it all comes down to a MIFA, Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional um, Funds Act. Now, a MIFA is largely geared uh, around endowments, and we're not talking about endowments, right? We may be, but we're not always talking about endowments. Um, endowments are funds where you, uh, it's technical, but basically you're not supposed to spend the principal, you're only supposed to spend the income, um, appreciate uh, whether recognized or not from those. But nonprofits hold funds that are not endowed. They could, many nonprofits hold funds where they could spend every dollar if they wanted to. But a MIFA also poses invest, imposes investment standards. And in most states, the version of a MIFA will say that in making decisions about investments, the board has to look to general economic conditions, the effect of inflation and deflation, tax consequences, the role of each investment in the overall portfolio, expected total return from income and appreciation, the charity's other resources, and in many states, including California, the needs of the charity, um, no, I'm sorry, this, this is not, the needs of the charity to fund and make distributions and preserve capital. In many states, a MIFA allows you to look at the effect of the investment on the, the charity's mission. Um, a, a MIFA also requires a diversification, and um, it's basically a total portfolio return. Look at the whole portfolio. Is it meeting your needs? Um, so this raises the question, is it possible for a nonprofit corporation under a MIFA um, and, and particularly for a C3 public charity that has no tax rules governing its, uh, its investments, to spend 100% of its funds on impact investments. Can it do that? Um, how, many, how, many, how many of you think that, that it would be okay for a charity to invest 100% of its dollars on impact investments? I'm seeing no hands. Okay. How many of you think you could invest? You think you could. It depends. Well, that's a good lawyer answer for anything, right? How many of you think you could spend 20% of your, of your assets on impact investments? Okay, I'm seeing more hands. Uh, how about 50? Okay, some yes, some no. So, um, I have divided, the whole point about an impact investment is it's supposed to be a prudent investment that, that brings you a pretty decent return, but also impacts um, environment, social, whatever. Now some of these are really good investments and some of them are really bad investments. So I think it's technically possible to devise an investment policy, and we've done this, that has 100% impact investing as long as you impose on that a prudence overlay. So I, I mean, it's not the impact investment per se that isn't okay or is okay, it's whether it's also a prudent investment or not. Because if it is a prudent investment and it meets these up MIFA tests, there's no reason why it can't also promote uh, social impact, and there's plenty of good investments out there. Now, some people, you know, at foundations will take the traditional approach and say, well, we, we, we can only invest in um, mutual funds, um, hire really good investment advisors, have them buy individual stocks and bonds, and that sort of thing. Maybe we'll take 10 or 20% of our portfolio and put it in venture capital, 
hedge funds, um, which actually are quite normal now, so I, I would even consider those as part of the, uh, the, the major part of the portfolio. And maybe we'll do some impact investments on a one-off basis, um, or maybe we'll just invest in the Goldman Sachs Impact Investing Fund, which some argue has meaning and some argue is pretty, pretty watered down. So that's a question. I don't know the answer, but I've certainly, I've certainly written investment policies for, for family foundations, for small foundations. Well, sp they're not necessarily small. I mean, they may have several hundred million dollars, which I, I don't know where we draw the line for small anymore. Um, is it a billion? I don't know. But where they're really focusing on imp impact investing and not on traditional investments. Um, so now we have, um, what slide is this? Okay, that was the state law slide. Now we're on 4944. Um, so this is the code section in the Internal Revenue Code that says specifically for private foundations, if you make a jeopardizing investment, uh, private foundation, you risk an excise tax. Now I have personally never had a client who's even had this issue come up in audit. I don't know if anyone has, but you have? No. Okay. Um, but nonetheless, it's in the code and we have to follow the rules. And um, the rules say that one exception to, and, and the rules have basically told us that if you follow a MIFA, if you follow a, a managed portfolio, a, a whole portfolio theory of investing, you're probably going to satisfy section 4944. So if you do that, you follow an investment policy, you hire outside advisors, you, you do all those things, you're probably going to be fine under 4944. But 4944 has an exception for something called a program-related investment, PRI. And this is where I spend a lot of my time helping private foundations figure out if they can invest money that is beyond impact investing, but that actually is a program-related investment. And what that means is that, as you, as you may know, private foundations have to pay out at least 5% of the value of their assets every year. Uh, for charitable purposes. Uh, uh, that includes a lot of things, but one of the things it includes is grants. So most foundations satisfy this via grants, but it also includes program-related investments. So private foundations are more and more investing in, in by, by investing I mean they're making loans uh, to charities for charitable, for, for, for activities, but, but more interestingly I think they're doing equity investments and loans in for-profit entities and they're getting credit for that as part of their charitable activity. Now, when did this start? This started um, way back in the 60s. Um, um, Paul, you were at the Ford Foundation doing some of this work back then. Um, and uh, we have regulations in 1972 that provide some very, very straightforward, but at the time, avant-garde examples of, of this. And, um, and we have updated examples that came out this decade that, that, that I helped to work on that provide um, a more, more sort of uh, modern 21st century examples of program-related investments. And these include quite a few things like equity investments in for-profits. Um, and um, the question always becomes, because the PRI test basically is this. Number one, you have to, um, you have to significantly further the accomplishment of the foundation's exempt activities through a PRI. So you don't have to have the entity that you're investing in be charitable, but you have to further the foundation's charitable mission by making the investment. Well, what kind of lawyer gobbledygook is that? Let's say, um, let's say that there's an impoverished area in a city, and um, one option is for the foundation to go in and hand out a hundred bucks to every poor person who's there. Well, arguably that's charitable. Um, probably is. Another example is for the foundation to go in and actually build a, um, you know, a resource, social resource center. Fine. But maybe what that community needs is a bank. Maybe what they need is a, a, a grocery store with healthy groceries. Maybe what they need is a job training program. Maybe they need all kinds of things. Those are going to be run, those, those things themselves cannot qualify for tax exemption. So what they're going to do is be for-profit entities that a private foundation can now invest in. And that's furthering the private foundation's mission of furthering charity because they're combating community deterioration by 
putting a bank or a grocery store or whatever in this neighborhood is going to help elim eliminate poverty, hopefully. So you've got a charitable purpose. You've got no significant purpose of the investment is the production of income or the appreciation of property. So in other words, it's got to further a charitable purpose and it's got to be something that isn't necessarily a good investment or something that you wouldn't do from the investment side of your portfolio. So if you think about it, we've got this, this giant box that is the foundation's corpus. And we've got a, a sliver of it, 5%, that has to go to charity every year. The rest of it can be invested in regular investments, impact investments, as long as overall the investment strategy is prudent. The 5% that's going to charity, and it can be more, uh, can be in grants, but it can also be in these PRIs. So we spend, and, and the other thing is the PRIs can't, uh, can't have any purpose of lobbying or political activity, but foundations already can't do that, so I don't know why they exactly they put that in the PRI recs. So we spend quite a bit of time, um, every day I would say, looking at investments that foundations provide to us and evaluating them and saying, is this investment uh, a PRI or an MRI? Uh, normally what happens is the foundation will come in with um, an analysis that they've already done that says, here are the economic effects of this analysis, because I'm a lawyer, I don't do that. And they'll say this is uh, you know, likely to have this return, these are the risks, these are the et cetera. And we'll look at it and, and they'll say, can this qualify as a PRI? We'll look at it and we'll say, well, what's the charitable purpose it's furthering? Um, can we make a realistic argument that no significant purpose of this is, is making money? And by that we mean, even if you're projecting a 5% or 10% return, how risky is it? Um, are other investors who are for profits, um, are, are, are the CZI folks um, and the Omidyars, are they investing in this or is this, you can't get investors so you really need a charity to catalyze this investment. Are you, um, uh, are you having a hard time getting investors at all? Um, are most of your investors nonprofits? So we've got six foundations lined up to do this but nobody else. And then just generally the overall risk of the investment. Is it secured? Is it not secured? There's all kinds of very creative program re related investments being done, including guarantees, uh, letters of credit, um, um, convertible debt, safe investments. You know what safes are? Um, I can't remember what the acronym sounds for, but it's basically um, a company that doesn't have a real structure yet will give you something called a safe. It's a document, you can look it up on the internet, and it basically says, if we ever do issue equity, uh, you'll get 5%, and here's what you're paying for that. Um, yeah, it's going to drive me crazy, and I'm going to think of this in the middle of the night, what SAFE stands for, but it was started by Y Combinator out in um, California, like, like so many of these things. Come on, California, right? Go Warriors. Um, so, I've struggled with... Um, with a lot of these issues, um, number one, are these, uh, are these investments, so I'm going I'm to turn now to some questions I've come up for myself. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. Let me stop here and say, does anyone else want to say anything or have any questions that they want to ask, which are more interesting than my questions? Yes. Thank you. Simple agreement for future equity is the safe. The magic of the internet. Yeah, so instead of doing a convertible debt note, like, like we'll write a, a PRI as a convertible note. It can be pages and pages and pages of covenants. We're making debt now, but we can convert it to equity on the happening of if you ever sell, if you ever go public, if you ever raise more than $2 million. A safe is a more generic document that we've used in PRI situations for that. Any other comments, questions before I ask myself questions? Yes. Ah, yes. Familiar. Um, this, we have 64 of these census tracts here in Cuyahoga County. And many of us are not experts at investments, certainly not in, in high dollar volume investments because we're nonprofit government. So are there pitfalls we should watch out for as we're reaching out to the world of rich folks who want to make social impact investments and try to get them to invest in our opportunity zones? So uh, when you say are, you're, you're, who are you with? Cuyahoga County. 
So you're with the county. Um, well, for individual investors, I don't think it matters. I mean, they, they, I don't think that there's necessarily pitfalls. It's just a strategy as to what's attractive to them. If you want foundation investors investing in this, um, you're going to have to jump through some more hoops because they're either going to do it as a mission-related investment, impact investment, in which case they can do it <coughs> if it's prudent. Sorry. <coughs> For a program-related investment, I'm not sure for a nonprofit if there's any real return on this. Is there? Uh, the tax benefit <coughs> doesn't apply unless you have capital gains. Right. So, you know, foundations pay a 2% tax on their income. This isn't likely to be a program-related investment vehicle. Now, somebody may come up with a vehicle, an intermediary vehicle, uh, which I haven't seen yet. And it's interesting. I had lunch with some of the folks in the clinic today, and somebody asked this question. Uh, in the clinic, so you, you, right? No, yeah, Abby, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, you and your colleague, yes, yes. Who I don't see here. Is he here? Anyway, um, so I don't know the answer to your question, but I do know that private foundation. We've had situations where we've had new market tax credits, low-income housing tax credits that that foundations have found a place for in that, uh, largely through PRIs. Yes, sir. Could you take the mic behind you? The, a PRI qualifies as the 5% of, of, of grant dollars. Correct. Correct. For a, a foundation, when they're making the decision as to whether or not to structure a PRI, I'm <coughs> curious is the decision points as to whether or not you structure a PRI um, as part of that 5% or you just, from the 95%, you just make a social impact investment? Mm -hmm. Is it all primarily driven by the fact that a PRI is essentially it's recoverable grant money and they get credit for it? Well, I think it's a little more complicated than that. I think that um, legally, from a legal standpoint, there, there's a practical answer and a legal answer. From a legal standpoint, I think you have to determine which bucket it fits in. And it's probably only going to fit in one bucket or the other. Because if it is a, um, if it is an imprudent investment, in other words, a very risky investment, it's, well, you c then, then you can do it as a PRI, right? Because no significant uh, purpose is the return of income. You may be able to squeeze that somehow into the very risky part of your, of your overall portfolio on the other side. But most foundations are not going to invest too much money in, in, in things that could also qualify as PRIs, as MRIs, because inherently they're, they're risk, super risky investments, um, even if they have social impact. So you've got to take away, there's two tests, right? There's social impact, mission, furthering your charitable purpose, and then the no significant purpose being investment. <clears throat> so if you meet those tests, the foundation's more likely to do it as a PRI. If you don't meet, you can meet the charitability test, but also have it be a, a, an investment that, 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 that's a really good investment that doesn't have that level of risk, and then they're going to do it from the, uh, from the regular investment portfolio or MRI side of their... Of their um. Now, in reality, um, the, judge, the line is very close sometimes, and people make judgment calls. And, you know, PRIs involve a lot more paperwork, a lot more hassle, special reporting on the tax return, something called expenditure responsibility if it's an investment in a for-profit. Some foundations don't like to bother with that. Some do. Um, so it, it's not as clear-cut or black and white as, um, as I'm making it sound. But, but, it, but people, you know... Uh, foundations do struggle with these these questions. Did that answer your question? It, it, it did, yeah. Okay. Other questions before I ask myself questions? Okay, so feel free any time to just pop your hand up. <coughs> so one of the big issues in impact investing is how do we know that we're doing any good? Now, first of all, you have to define what's good. And, of course, not everyone's going to have the same sense of what, what, what is a positive impact in society. For some people, eliminating firearms is a positive impact. For other people, that's, that's not. That's, that's a negative impact. 
Um, but let's assume that we pick something that, that, that the people at the foundation agree, um, you know, uh, curbing climate change or um, uh, assuming, assuming we believe in that or um, uh, eliminating poverty. Everyone agrees that that's a poverty's bad. So um, how do we measure that? And, and, the, and the answer is um, there is no standard measurement for, for this, but there's, there's hundreds of organizations that have been trying for many, many years to figure out how you measure social return on investment, or SROI, not to be confused with SRI. This is, all goes on the bingo card. Um, social return on investment is a very complicated thing to measure. Um, there are these things called social impact bonds, which is another form of social investment that's come up in the last, uh, I would say, five to ten years. And those are bonds where um, there is a very specific measurement. Uh, so, and the way they work is you invest in a bond, um, let's say the purpose of the bond is to um, uh, increase the, or decrease the rate of people who leave prison coming back into prison. And um, that's something that you can actually measure, right? So you invest in this bond, and if your um, if your bond is successful or unsuccessful, the, on the exact social measurement depends on uh, whether money is returned. And typically, it's the opposite. So if it's socially productive, you don't get your money back. If they don't do a good job, you do get your money back. I know that's a little funny, but <clears throat> so th those are measurable. But it's very hard to measure with any meaningful uh, metric. Um, uh, some of these other things, like how successful was your was your I your impact? Sometimes you can measure in terms of numbers of people that that come through um, changes in income, but it's very difficult. And so, unlike regular investments, where there's a pretty good return on investment metric, um, we we struggle in this whole area to figure out whether an impact investment is is any good. Any questions or comments on that? No. Okay. Um, the next thing um, that, that I just wanted to throw out there is number two, which is, um, <coughs> is it possible, I raised this earlier, but is it possible for a private foundation to spend 100% of their money on um, program-related investment work? Now, when I say 100%, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, impact investing and program-related. So what you would do is you would take the, the, the the part of your of your corpus that you're investing for investment sake, you you would invest only in impact investments, and the part that you're doing for charitable, you would do only PRIs and pay your staff obviously, which counts as a charitable expenditure, but no grants, just all PRIs. So on the PRI side, yes, it's possible to do 100% of your charitable work as PRIs. It's a little bit complicated because what happens is, well, you have a 5% payout requirement. If the PRI pays back, so if you make a loan to a for-profit for $100,000 and you get it back, now you've got a, a credit against your debit against, against your payout requirement. So if in 2019 you make a $100,000 PRI, you get to take that $100,000 against your 5% payout. If it gets paid back in 2021, you've now got to take that same $100,000 and pay it out again. So when it is paid back, if it's paid back, they're, not, they're often not paid back, but if it is paid back, it, it increases your payout requirement. But it is possible to juggle all that and, and do a tremendous amount of PRI work. I don't think I've seen a foundation that does 100% PRI, but I've seen some that are doing pretty close. Um, and um, and so, so on, now on the, on the other side, as I said, for public charities, can you do 100% of your investment side as impact investing? Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel more comfortable for some reason, although the legal standards is the same, with a family foundation, with a family board that chooses to do that. Although, rather than a big, you know, um, a big, pro you know, the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, whoever, um, the Gunn Foundation, um, I'd feel less comfortable, but I can't really articulate why, because the legal standards is exactly the same. Um, is it prudent? And um, and so I have seen some small, small, uh, smaller family foundations do this. I've never seen a super large foundation uh, do that. Um, next question uh, is sort of where do we go from here with program-related investments? The, they've evolved so much over the last. Uh, do you want to say something? I'm glad somebody's going to answer my question. Mr. Wexler, before we leave the 100% impact, yeah. 
I just wanted to sort of make a comment. My experience is that the phraseology, although some foundations have, are striving to get to 100%, comes from a conversation. There was a, 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 a critic, uh, um, provocateur within the foundation world named Jed Emerson. Oh, yeah. Who talked about how the 5% rule really doesn't put foundations in a position to harness everything they have to move for the good. If you invest your portfolio in very traditional ways and only care about return on investment, you don't use screens, positive or negative, you just care about the ROI, the thought is that you leave 95% of your total corpus on the sidelines from doing good. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, the notion of 100% is sort of a theoretical concept in many ways. How much can you try to move to mission is, is sort of the goal in the world that I travel. Yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, but, but picture a foundation that has $5 million, you know, and that's all they've got. And they want to invest it all on the impact side. I, I could see that being a little bit easier than your foundation. Well, in Ohio, we have the Tony Wells Foundation. It holds itself out as a mission investing, pure 100% investment. Mm -hmm related operation, no grants. And I'm sure they deposit their cash in CDFIs and credit unions, and they manage all of their investments in ways that have double, triple bottom lines so that they can say they accomplished Well, where are they making their payout? If I have no idea. Staff salaries? I mean, that's... I don't know. You know, Jed Emerson is, is a provocateur. I mean, I've, 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 I know him well. I've known him for many years. He was one of the leaders of the social impact movement. But Ford and others are talking about our Correct. percent, so you're getting to a really yeah we're get you know, we're getting I think about how yes I it. I think there's an evolution uh, that may be happening where you know I, as I said uh, a few years ago there were estimated four trillion dollars in the impact investing space and um, uh, is that going to continue um, I think it's again like the three point shot in basketball which I'll come back to to finish off which is that you know in the 60s. Um, the three-point shot was put in in the American Basketball Association, the ABA, as sort of a, a gimmick. And nobody really could take that shot very well. Uh, it came into the NBA in 1979 as an experiment for one year. But it was really frowned upon that, you know, that that would be the basis. Well, now, you know, with my team and some other teams, um, the s statistics have shown, and it's kind of logical, right, if you... If you make, um, I'm not going to do the math right, but if you make 33% of your three-point shots, that's as good as making 50% of your two-point shots. So why wouldn't you do that? Um, because most gr good three-point shooters can make 35 to 40%. Why wouldn't that be your strategy? So as, as metrics increase, as statistical knowledge increases, as we have more ability to measure return on investment, um, I, I think we're seeing the same thing in the investment space where people are um, getting more comfortable, just like they are taking a three-pointer, um, putting money into the, to the impact investing space. Um, yes, one more question. Um, yes. So rather than asking or focusing only on what would be the measurable impact of impact investment, shouldn't we at least as a trivia question in an academic environment as the question, what's the cost of not investing for the social, for the greater good? <coughs> I love that. I love that question. And yes, you should in the academic environment look at that <laughs> because I'm not equipped to, but that's an excellent question. Um, anything else before we're... Okay. Um, oh, one more question. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. Well, I'm I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, in the second category I put in there for for-profit investors, you know, that's a, that I think that's an important thing, and I think corporations would certainly have to be careful about investing their surplus in a way that didn't maximize return for their shareholders. But there's always a balance between building goodwill in the corporation. That's why I think a lot of the impact investing is going to come from individual investors, families, and the foundation side of things, and universities and things like that. I, 
I'm having, I'm being a little hard pressed to see, you know, Apple or other big companies putting all of their money into impact investments, but I haven't studied that and I may just very well be wrong. Um, I'm getting more questions, but I don't know how the time. One more. Yes, sir. Um, it's an interesting question that's unresolved, but I think the answer is yes. Um, uh, the, the donor advised fund laws came in in 2006 as part of the Pension Protection Act, which is neither about pensions nor protection. And um, I, I think that um, uh, donor advised funds are not allowed to make distributions to for-profit entities um, they, uh, without expenditure responsibility. But I think by implication, they can, they can make program-related investments as long as they do it the same way a private foundation does. But we don't have regulations on that. So I've done it, but I, I don't know if it's uh, completely been laid out. I don't think anyone will challenge it until regs come out saying, you know, you can't do it. But it depends on your strategy of, of advising clients on that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, right. So we talked about that a little bit at lunch, and I didn't see that many students in the room. Well, I'm I'm making an assumption, which I shouldn't make. Ageism. We're all students. Thank you. That's so wonderful. Um, I think there's a lot of jobs on the non-legal side in the impact investing space with companies that are advising people on impact investments. It's just like everything else. It's a it's a new area of consulting that people are getting a lot of expertise in and and investing. So I think that's one area. The big firms, like I said, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, all those folks have impact investing funds. If you're interested in that, that's a place. On the legal side, um, either helping, um, you know, looking for nonprofit law firms like mine that do PRI advice, um, we certainly get into this. And then um, just people that, lawyers that advise on investments because not, you know, you still have to uh, look at all the other things you look at in an investment, like is the partnership or LLC agreement properly put together? Um, you know, what are the what are the rights of uh, the the drags along drag alongs and tag alongs, and what happens on a sale and all those typical things. So, um, I think there's and of course on the academic side, there's a ton of space for people to to get to get into this. Um, and then there's the analyst side, right? There's we, we need more people figuring out how you measure these things. So people who are statisticians and people who are, um, who are analysts. So I, I do think there's a lot of jobs in this area. And of course, I'm always happy to talk to students if they want to. If you want to send any students to call me, I always give them, you know, 15, 20, half hour free time to talk to anybody. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for... <laughs>